All this is Dr. Mubeen Sayyid from drbean.com. Welcome to one more show. I am just getting ready, wearing my little hand mask, and let's start. So the discussion today is interesting. Here is how we would go over this, because there is a lot of data in here, a lot of mechanisms to look at, and I don't want us to get lost in there. So what we'll do is this. First of all, we'll see the summary of the possibility of soluble spike proteins. Soluble spike proteins means the spike proteins that are generated by the vaccine that get out of the cell, then become dissolved in the fluids, and then enter the blood. And then from there, they can connect with various A's2 in the blood. This is what is the hypothesis. So it's not me saying here is a fact. This is what this preprint of the study said. And so um, what I want to do together is the following. Number one, we look at the summary. Number two, we look at the mechanism of what the authors are proposing. They are trying to propose a mechanism for thrombosis. So the thrombosis that is observed after AstraZeneca or Johnson & Johnson or other adenovirus-based vaccines is where they are trying to prove that, hey, we think this is the way that this is happening, the thrombosis is happening. So we'll talk about the mechanism that they're proposing. Then we'll talk about the strength or weakness of the mechanism. We'll talk about some of the comments on their preprint as well and how they are responding to some of those. So uh, let's start our discussion and we'll go through this. If you are someone who is constrained on time, then just initial four or five minutes where I can present the summary and then you are, uh, the rest is detail and mechanisms. So we're starting with the, um, with my artwork. So I was doing this artwork over the weekend, long weekend. This is called, this is titled Balance. So with the artwork, just to start you with a color splash. So here is the, here is drbean.com. This is, uh, before we go there, I wanna show you the study here. This is a study, this is in Research Square. It is a preprint. And they have said vaccine-induced COVID-19 mimicry. And I'll explain what they mean. And then they are saying mimicry syndrome. And that is where they are trying to explain how thrombosis may occur. With this, there are certain other links as well. These links are present in the description. One of the links is thrombosis with thrombocytopenia syndrome. This is the original German study where the authors had said, here is how we think this is happening. That is a platelet factor four um, involving thrombocytopenia. Then here is another um, reference. Again, if you don't like Wikipedia, you can take the, the term from here and look it up in your favorite uh, site, for example, up to date or other such sites. So this is what is an N terminal of a uh, protein. And the reason I brought this up is that we will talk about that during the discussion. Then what is RNA splicing? Again, we'll talk about it, but here is a reference. You don't like Wikipedia, please just Google it and find it in any place where you like or buy an immunology book or genetics book and you would have those in there as well. Then this is the actual uh, study. Then here is Johnson & Johnson. They talk more about AstraZeneca, but I thought Johnson & Johnson here can be useful as well. This is Moderna. Authors conclude that Moderna or Pfizer may not have this problem that they think is there with the, with the adenoviruses. And uh, this is some more detail about the gene, uh, sorry, gene I'm saying, vaccines and different vaccines. And here is a, another mechanism that they have used in their paper. And that mechanism is called antibody dependent cellular cytotoxicity or ADCC. This is one of the allergy types. So we're gonna talk about that as well. So if you are okay, I'm going to close these just so that my computer doesn't become too uh, bogged down by these. Oh, I should not have closed that one. So let me actually go back and open that because I'm going to go over it. So one second. <clears throat> so that is here. I'm going to close this. And I'm going to leave this one here. 
Okay, so let's start. <clears throat> it is what's happening. First, we'll go over a summary. They are saying, so one, it is a preprint. The data in here is a hypothesis. I saw over the weekend a lot of uh, media calling this out as some fact. Lots of people tweeting about this and even sending me messages that, hey, did you see that here is a, a proof that we have soluble spike proteins? Uh, we will look at the paper. Authors themselves are saying this is a hypothesis. And it is built on partially in silico and par partially in vitro. What does that mean? Some part of this study is observed using computer programs and taking hints from the computer program, then some part of that is done inside the cells as well. So it is kind of partial study. And they're trying to explain the basic reason for this study is that they're trying to explain the mechanism for thrombosis that is happening with, let's say, AstraZeneca or Johnson & Johnson. Of course, many of you would say, hey, this is happening with Moderna's and others as well. But their author's primary focus here is actually adenovirus-based vaccines. And authors actually think that messenger RNA-based vaccines may not be doing this. And they actually say that use messenger RNA vaccine more than the adenovirus-based vaccines. So this is the basic summary. What they're saying is the, the hypothesis now some parts of my analysis. This is a hypothesis. So actually criticizing a hypothesis is not right. I mean, they still have to prove it. And they're saying we are working on it. So we should not come out swinging to say this is wrong. Or we should not come out saying the sky has fallen. The authors are still working on it. They have put a hypothesis forward. I think one of the, um, uh, I don't know if it is a good thing or not, but one outcome of this pandemic and the work is that now hypothesis, which may not even be uh, good enough, can become preprints, which is the concept of a preprint. So in a way, it is fine. But then there are lots of fringe hypotheses that are coming up as well. Again, it is fine. This is how medicine and, and science moves forward. It is a hypothesis. Interestingly, this hypothesis by itself does not stand. So they have to kind of still fall back on the hypothesis of heparin-induced um, thrombocytopenic uh, thrombotic thrombocytopenia or vaccine-induced thrombotic thrombocytopenia. They want to use that mechanism with their mechanism with a possibility of the vaccine vaccines adjuvants, parts of the vaccine, the other parts of the formulation causing um, uh, clotting. So all these three, they say our mechanism, mechanism proposed by the German researchers and the vaccine adjuvant mechanism, all those three have to work together to be able to create the clotting. So they're saying they themselves, this may not be yet sufficient. So they need to prove a lot more and they, I would show you their comments that they're saying we're working on it. Now, let's continue. A simple, quick thing. So let's say if you wanted to dis disengage here and say, just tell me, is this going to kill us now? So no, we are not there. Neither are the authors there. They are proposing a hypothesis to say, hey, we think this may be causing the clotting. In that process, the mechanism they are trying to explain needs the spike protein to be soluble and to be able to enter the blood vessel to cause damage to the blood vessels to cause clotting. So they did not get out to say, we, are, we can prove that spike protein can go in the blood. They got out to say, how can we have a vaccine produced spike protein injure a blood vessel causing clotting? And that is what they are trying to pr uh, prove. So has a sky fallen yet? I don't think so. And we will continue to wait and uh, work with the authors or figure out wh where further they go. Maybe this is at the end of the day, this guy has fallen. But I would also submit to you that please look at overall number of people vaccinated as well to kind of balance out. And I would show you comments by the authors addressing this, that hey, if this hypothesis is something that is correct, then why is not everyone getting the vaccine in this ballpark, or why not a majority? Why a smaller population? And why only some parts of the body, not everyone? So we will see that. Too.
Now, what is the hypothesis? So here, if you have, if you just wanted to know what is this, here it is. Do, should you be concerned? No, there is a lot more data to be uh, provided, proof to be created, mechanism to be understood, to be able to say this is true. And authors believe that this is also a hypothesis. So here, summary done. Now let's talk about what is the mechanism? What is it that they're talking about? Here is what they're talking about. They're saying, imagine this is a piece of genetic code. So we know for vaccines, this genetic code for spike protein is present in two ways. If it is a messenger RNA-based vaccine, for example, Moderna or Pfizer, then what we do is we have a lipid nanoparticle, a small piece of fat in which the messenger RNA that can produce a spike protein, that piece of messenger RNA is stuck in this little lipid nanoparticle. This lipid nanoparticle would enter a cell, bring this messenger RNA, which would stay inside the cytoplasm. And the authors actually are banking on that. When they are comparing these vaccines, they say we like messenger RNA vaccines more from this problem point of view because they have messenger RNA, which never enters the nucleus. So here is a messenger RNA, and we know then the spike proteins are produced and all the rest of the immune system preparation. On the other hand, the adenovirus-based vaccines, for example, J&J, for example, AstraZeneca, for example, Sputnik, can see no, and there may be more. Actually, there are more. These vaccines we know have an adenovirus. This adenovirus's DNA has become changed to incorporate the RNA for spike protein. This is where the authors have a problem, or this is where is the start of their hypothesis. Their start of hypothesis is the following, that is, in case of a messenger RNA vaccine, the mRNA stays in the cytoplasm, works there, and ends there. On the other hand, an adenovirus-based vaccine, it will be, and we have done these discussions exhaustively before, it will be the virus is brought into the cell, then it is in a phagosome, then this virus is, and remember this is a replication Defic deficient virus. It cannot replicate, but it can sustain there for some time. So this virus has the DNA of the spike protein. This virus is broken up in the phagosome when we attach a lysosome with it. Then the virus attaches to the nucleopore of the, of the nucleus. It injects this DNA inside the nucleus. This DNA inside the nucleus becomes transcribed into a messenger RNA. That messenger RNA comes out in the cytoplasm, helps make the uh, proteins, uh, spike proteins. Some of them would be shredded. And they, uh, for the hypothesis, I'm going to say what they're saying, some of these spike proteins would appear on the cell surface, but they are bound to the cell surface. They cannot go anywhere because they have a cell anchoring mechanism. And that allows the immune system to come and attach here inspect this antigen and then become activated. This is the mechanism, let's say normal mechanism. In this mechanism, where are they providing a problem? They are saying this area, this area has a problem. And that is what we are going to look at. So let's go back and we are going to first talk about this area, then this, then this, then this, and that is a discussion. So let's start. First of all, imagine that this is the DNA, DNA for the spike protein. We know that the SARS-CoV-2 actually does not have a DNA. It is an RNA-based virus. So what happens is for, for adeno-based vaccines, we create a DNA from the RNA. That DNA has to then get into the nucleus and become transcribed into an RNA. Now the DNA piece or the RNA piece, genetic piece from the spike protein is taken and then that is converted to a DNA. 
Now DNA has, and so has RNA. DNA has a few kind of genetic material in there. So this is the key part. So please pay attention to this part. The RNA or DNA has a set of classes of, of genetic material. So imagine that this is a gene. This whole material here is the genetic code, the recipe to make spike protein. Inside there, there is some part of genetic code that will help make some protein, some part of the protein. And then there is some more parts interspersed within the genetic material, which are, at least from our understanding, they are useless. They are introns. They are just sitting. It is like if you read a book for recipes and there are some pages that are left blank and it says this page intentionally left blank. So we don't know why it is left blank. It is just there. That is a similar thing as well in the genes as well. There's some part of genes material or recipe written is written and we know it is useful. And then there are some genetic material pieces that are use, useless. At least we think useless. They may be useful in other ways. Now from this DNA to make a functional RNA, what we have to do is we create we create a pre-RNA. We create a premature RNA. That RNA is sort of a reflection of the DNA. So the, that RNA has a similar structure, that it has exons. Exons are parts of the gene where the recipe written is useful. And then there are introns. Introns are part of the recipe or pages in the book that are just left blank. Although they're not blank here, but they are just not functioning. So imagine the DNA is brought into the nucleus by the adenovirus. That DNA is being transcribed now. Transcription means to create RNA from the DNA. Why do we need to create RNA from this DNA? Inside the nucleus, when the DNA is brought, this DNA has to be converted into RNA, which needs to go back out in the cytoplasm where the machinery is present, the ribosomes are present to make the spike proteins. So we have to do the whole thing in reverse. So this RNA that is formed in the nucleus needs these introns to be removed from it. So this is a processing of the RNA. So how are these introns removed? How are these blank pages removed to create a cohesive synchronized recipe? Inside the nucleus, there are small cutting enzymes, which are called spliceosomes or spliceosomes, spliceosomes. They do splicing, they do splicing, they cut. These are mostly five proteins they are, they are enzymes that are made up of five proteins. This is like if you have a scissor, you can look at the scissor and you can say, well, it has two parts to it. And then these two parts have further two parts. One is the handle side, one is the cutting side. And then there is a screw which is used to put them together. So that is a five piece scissors. That is the same thing over here. This protein complex that does the cutting is made up of five proteins. This is called small nuclear ribonucleoproteins or SNRNPs, scissors, scissors for the, for the DNA. <laughs> this scissor here, if you check out, imagine this is the same RNA that was just made. Adenovirus arrived in the cell, brought the DNA that went into the nucleus. From the DNA, we made a premature RNA. Now we are processing the RNA and removing the blank pages. Those blank pages are being removed by the scissors, which are called SNRNPs. Those scissors here, I can show you. These scissors, what they do is they attach with intron. And now this is the first question. Why do they attach to the intron and not other part of the genetic material? In the intron, here, an intron has a specific structure that can be recognized. An intron in the beginning has something that is called a donor site. 
So when you would read this study or paper or hypothesis, you would see again and again the word used, a donor part of the intron or donor supplies site. And similarly, an acceptor supplies site. What does that mean? Simply those blank pages, there is a beginning of the blank pages and end of the blank pages. The beginning part is called the donor end. The end part is called the acceptor end. How does how do we simplify it for ourselves? Simply, these are the indicators on the introns that can be recognized. This is like if we can look at the recipe, the book, we can identify where are the blank pages by looking at them. So in the case of genetic material, identifying where the blank pages are, our spliceosomes can identify them with certain markers. Those markers are called donors, branch, acceptors. And you would see that these words in the study, all whenever you see that, all you have to think is, this is the area of the genetic material that will be removed. So now if I go back here, this is how it is removed. The intron or the piece that need to be removed, the blank page, becomes connected with these spliceosomes and then spliceosome can fold that intron in a loop and bring the two ends, ends together and tie the two ends and remove that. This is like if you take a rope and you, you take that rope, it's a straight rope, and then you bring it a, in a loop like this and then you cut it from here. This is what these guys do. And they remove this loop and what is left is just the exon Exon are the functional part of the recipe, the written actual material, and that becomes the recipe. That is the messenger RNA. It, it is further processed in the nucleus. A cap is added, a tail is added, then it comes out, and then it works with ribosome. So far, so good. The reason that I had to explain this is because their hypothesis works on this process. What they are saying is the following. They are saying, it is possible, and they think it is very much possible because of their com computer simulation they have done, it is possible that instead of the correct piece to be removed, our spliceosomes are accidentally removing incorrect pieces. Right? So, Instead of, so let's say here is a rope and this part needs to be removed. Instead of removing that part, maybe partially that part is removed plus a good part is removed. The result of that is that now the recipe is wrong. The, let's say the last page of the recipe is missing. And now you have cooked everything, but the last page is not there. So that part is not cooked. And they are thinking that that la last page. So let's actually look here. I've made this mechanism. So that normal. So keep that thought in your mind that I was talking about. I'm going to go back to a different part of the mechanism. That normal messenger RNA that was developed with the correct removal of the blank pages, the correct removal of introns, that messenger RNA comes out in the cytoplasm of the cell it attaches with the ribosome and I'm kind of keeping it, uh, I'm slow, but I'm keeping it simple uh, or not too detailed because we have done this discussion before as well. This messenger RNA connects with the ribosome and ribosome will make the protein, in this case, spike protein. Now, if you look at the mechanism they are using, they're saying this spike protein that is formed has an anchor point on it for the cell membrane. And this spike protein would appear on the cell surface, but would get stuck on the surface. It will be not released. This is like if you buy a balloon with the gas, hydrogen gas in it, or whatever gas they use, helium, which causes the balloon to actually rise up. And you have a string with which you hold the balloon. And if you accidentally break that string, then the balloon is going to fly away. So here, this balloon is a spike protein, but it has a string attached to it, which binds it to the cell membrane. So this spike protein cannot go anywhere except being stuck to the cell surface. 
which would then in turn cause immune cells to come and identify it and process it. We know that this spike protein can actually be shredded as well. And those endosomes would create small pieces, broken pieces of it, and those will be presented. But let's just continue with this hypothesis, this concept that the authors are using so that we can see what they are saying. So here we have, in normal cases, the spike protein gets shown on the surface. It has an anchor to bind it to the cell membrane. It cannot go anywhere. This is a normal function. Now let's see what is the problem. The problem that uh, the folks are hypothesizing. So see here, this is an abnormal splicing or cutting. Here, the red part needed to be removed. But there is some part of the good part of the recipe, a good page of the recipe, a written page of the recipe is also accidentally removed. So the first question to ask is why? Why is the enzyme making such an error? Because enzymes do not make such errors. And their answer to that is that because we are producing an artificial DNA using an adenovirus system, and that DNA goes into the nucleus, this system is not as they use different words, so I forgot the word they use, but let us let me use my word that this is not as stable and it is prone for errors. And so what happens is inside the nucleus, when we are trying to, when the spliceosomes are trying to create splices in it, or they're cutting the blank pages out, they sometimes incorrectly cut the good pages out as well, which results in a piece of RNA, if you see here, this has a little red part here, and the black part is gone, which was a good part. So it produces an RNA that is a incorrect RNA. So this incorrect RNA, so give me one second, it's saying that you're having trouble. Um, showing it on on Twitch. So I'm going to just remove it. So, so back here, I hope that you are able to um, continue to see. There was, there was some error I just saw. Anyway, so back here. So they are saying that the RNA that is now produced is an incorrect partial RNA. When this partial RNA will be worked on by the ribosome. And I have not shown that part of the diagram, the, the part above. The ribosome will now make a protein, the spike protein, which is partial spike protein. And the membrane anchoring part is missing. And when that is missing, this is like a balloon that is filled with helium without a thread. And as soon as it is formed, it just gets out of the cell. And it would just dissolve in the local tissue fluids. From there, it can go to lymph and node. And then from lymph nodes, it can go into the blood. Or it can go through the local uh, membrane. Uh, local inflammation would cause the local blood vessels to open up. And it would get into the blood vessels and go there. There are lots of things that are kind of they need further explanation. But let's continue to provide this um, possibility that this is happening. So now they're saying this partial spike protein has now come out of the cell. It has detached from the cell. And now it is going to go into the blood vessel. Once it is in the blood vessel, how would it reach the blood vessel is a separate point. But let's say it has reached the blood vessel. Inside the blood vessel, now this partial spike protein will bind with antibodies against it. Plus, it would bind with the ACE2 enzymes on the endothelium. And this complex binding to the ACE2 will bring the spike protein to attach with this the blood vessel surface. Then antibodies would attack them together. That would cause the local natural killer cells. So they, they think it is ADCC mechanism, anti, uh, antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity. 
and I'll, I'm explaining that right now. So what happens is in this case, natural killer cells will come and attach with the antibody using CD16 or CD32 receptors that they have on their surface. This would in turn cause natural killer cells to release cytokines that would kill the endothelial cell. And what are the cytokines that natural killer cell can release that would kill this endothelial cell? Natural killer cells can release perforins and granzymes, just like we've talked about cytotoxic T cells or other cells like macrophages. Natural killer cells kill the cells. Their function is to kill the cells. So they are actually experts in producing and releasing perforins and granzymes. Perforin make holes in the cell and granzymes are like grenades. They are proteases. These are enzymes that break proteins. They would get into the cell. They would break the proteins there. The cell would commit suicide and it would die. This is one possible mechanism. They're, this is called ADCC. So they're not bringing in macrophage in the play here or dendritic cell or neutrophil or anything else. They feel it is natural killer cells that are going to do the damage. The second possibility, so these are their possibilities. The second possibility is that when this spike protein attaches to ACE2, so look at the right side of the diagram, that attachment, of course, causes the receptors for the antibodies to become available. Because when the spike protein is attached to the cell, antibodies are going to attack them those antibodies can then bind with the cell through the FC receptors. That would cause complement system to become activated. And we have talked about complement. These are proteins generated by the liver, and they take part in innate immunity. These complements, when they sit on a cell, that cell is going to die. So they think that the complement would become activated by this combination of the spike protein and it's not a full spike protein. It's a damaged spike protein. It is soluble. It is partial. It is not full. And anyways, the combination of spike protein with the ACE2 receptor and antibodies, which would then cause the FC receptor, which is antibody receptor on the cell surfaces to appear, will cause activation of complement system. Complement system activation would attract C3B which is a part of the complement, plus it would cause complement cascade, which I have done these things in the past in coagulability, hypercoagulability. That is why I didn't go into detail. But it would cause complement cascade, local damage would occur, thrombosis would start. They also think that it is possible that red blood cells will be attracted in this area. Red blood cells have receptors for complement, which would then cause the red blood cells to start clumping up as well, and thrombosis would start occurring. This is the basic idea. Now, I want to go over some parts of the study and look at the gaps. So instead of me talking about the gaps, I want to show you some of the gaps in the comment. Then I would talk about where are the problems with this hypothesis. So I hope you are ready. Because when you see it on the surface of it, it seems like we have a problem. So let's see. <clears throat> what I would like you to see here is that every time they are challenged with some minor challenges, they would back up and they would say, working on it. Or we understand and we agree with you and we are working on it. So let's see. I have actually um, highlighted it. I accidentally closed the sky. So I just have to find my highlights again. So please bear with me. Majority of the folks here have said, hey, great job, good, good work. But then there are some who have actually asked and good, um, good questions they have asked. For example, this person has said, Eva, this elegant explanation does not seem to be consistent with the finding that messenger RNA vaccines also produce the vaccine-induced thrombocytopenic purpura. So this person said, hey, if this is how it happens, then what happens in uh, messenger RNA vaccines? And so then they respond and they say, but anyways, this is a hypothesis. They're talking about their talk. 
we are working on to generate more data by different experiments and we will try to prove our assumptions. So please realize that they themselves are still not able to back up the hypothesis. It's a good thing, it's, a, it's science that they have a hypothesis. And they say, hey, we are working to prove it. Maybe somebody else can work to prove it as well. Meanwhile, you give me comments. So this is author. So here, this is Rolf. And he's saying, dear Eva, and then he's responding. OK, we'll continue. Here is another question. HWA said, this paper makes very sweeping, sweeping claims about the in vivo inside our bodies, clinical complications without even doing something as basic as Western blot. A Western blot is a test in which you can see what kind of proteins are present, how heavy they are, and how far they travel on a paper, which is um, which is magnet electromagnetized. I'm just simplifying it. So they're saying, this person is saying, hey, if you really think that this is what is happening, then use those cells, produce these proteins, put those proteins on a piece of paper and show us. And yes, this is actually a very simple, very cheap, very common test to do. So he said, as simple as a Western blot to prove that the truncated messenger RNA are even translated. This is a very important point this person is raising. They are raising this, that usually are ribosomes will not engage with the messenger RNA that is truncated or damaged. So they don't work on those. Or if they do engage with these, they would leave the function in the middle and there will be nothing made. But here we are saying, the authors are saying, that somehow messenger RNA will be produced, that will be damaged messenger RNA, and that would still create a spike protein. And that spike protein would still be able to bind and do all the damage, but the string to attach to the cell will not be present. So just one function that they need is missing, but all the rest is present. So this person said, hey, you could have proved it. And then they said, a Western blot showing secreted truncated forms of spike would be the absolute most basic thing that they should have done. And they're correct. What this person is saying, you put some cells together, you trigger them according to this hypothesis, let them make damaged spike proteins. Now, if you test the damaged spike protein versus whole spike protein, their weights are different. So on the page, they would travel to different, uh, uh, different distances. And you can very simply say, look, here is a truncated spike protein, a bad spike protein. And it's a very simple thing to do. Then they say, this person says, a staining experiment showing that these truncated forms stick to ACE2 cells in vitro would also be pretty basic. And then they're saying, you know what? Take these broken spike proteins or damaged spike proteins, stain them when they bind with ACE2 and show that that staining, through the staining, show that this really happened. So he said, very, very tiny, simple test could have been done to prove what you're saying you saw. To which the author responds, actually, we are working exactly on these independent experiments. And we even want to produce recombinant protein that are C-terminally truncated. truncated. C-terminal truncation means the other end. And to show their binding capacity on AS2, we have shown only the fusion between spike and luciferase. Luciferase is a test protein. But we will also use GFP fusion for the co-culture experiment, all planned. This is version one of the preprint. So this is a preprint of the preprint. But we really thought to share our results because we felt that this is important finding should be pre-published to the scientific community, also to discuss the issue with all of you. So within the preprint, this is also still the version one. So, and this is a very important point that HW is making that, hey, guys, you could very simply actually prove what you're saying. And they say, well, working on it. OK, let's continue. Imagine this, that I had to read and highlight the whole thing and then had to highlight the comments as well. So here, Brunella says, thank you for this very interesting paper. Alamgir et al. found a number of transcripts 
due to unexpected slicing events. So unexpected, unexpected slicing means incorrect cutting of the RNA. So incorrect removal of the pages, right? However, they observed that the trans transcriptome, the result of two different cell lines appear to be respond responding differently to the vaccine vector. Your study analyzed transcriptome of HeLa cells, which are cancerous cells. So what they're saying is this person, that if you put that broken RNA in one cell versus another cell, the cell's behavior is different. Not every cell would do the same thing. The cells here that these authors used to do partial testing were cancerous cells. And why do we use cancer cell in testing? Because cancer cells are long living cells. They don't die and they keep working and keep making proteins. So it is actually to use, it is actually easy and fundamentally useful to use a cancerous cell because it would just act like a machine and keep making things. So it's not that they're wrong in producing the using the cancer cells. This person is saying, maybe you use cancerous cell that produce these incorrect proteins and, and regardless of these proteins being incorrect, they produce it anyways, because that is what a cancer cell does. It removes, cancer cell is out of any control. So it doesn't care for normal behaviors. So to which they responded and they said, that's a very good point. Actually, we plan to infect with our collaborators in ULM hepatic cells and muscle cells to analyze their splicing events. And we assume that there are cell type specific differences because of differences in splice factor gene expression. All these data will be included in the final paper, of course. So they responded once again and said, OK, we'll work on that, too, and we'll bring that data. Too. So still, they, every time there is a pushback, there are many more comments saying, great job. You did awesome. You proved something. And they would say, yeah, thank you very much. Awesome. But wherever they get challenged, they back off immediately and say, OK, we are working on it, which is fine. Here, and here Mars says to them, have you looked at whether the splice variant protein, whether in frame or not, bind endogenous proteins in infected cells? In frame and out of frame means when you have a, when you have a recipe, the gene there are parts of the gene that are called in frame. They are the ones that are going to express. And then there could be out of frame genes, which incorrect splicing can cause. Or could all already be present and splicing needs to bring them in frame. Some, some genetic thing here. So have you looked at whether the splice, do these cells secrete other factors that may be induced by internal splice variants? This is very important. He's saying, this person is saying, um, they were not supposed to do this, the cells. Do you think that the cell itself has a problem that it is now secreting things that it should not secrete? To which they say, the authors, no, we haven't done such analysis. Just by biology and due to the leader sequence which is present, present past the amino terminal end, we expect that all splice events, most of which out of frame, cause the secretion of the protein variants because the missing transmembrane anchor sequences. So they're saying, we expect that anything that would cut the end would create a spike protein that would not have an anchor and it would be secreted out. Again, over here, one could say that, hey, an incorrectly produced RNA will not translate into all of these things. And that is the challenge we saw above when they backed off and they said, yeah, we're working on it. Again, I don't want to attack the authors. They're doing something to figure out maybe there is something here. So they haven't stood on their feet here to say, this is it, we found something. They're saying, working on it. So we should take it as that as well. And as you can see, if you keep going, it is a very similar uh, response set that where there is a challenge, the response is uh, working on it. And where there is a, hey, you did a great job, for example, there is another very important challenge here. This is a very important challenge as well. I am not a scientist, so this person says, but just a 62-year-old citizen who six weeks after AstraZeneca first dose has a count of 426 neutralizing antibodies. Now, this is very important, and I would discuss this with you as well. According to your model, 
on soluble aberrant spike proteins, meaning broken bad proteins that would enter the bloodstream. How confident can I face? How confidently can I face the second AstraZeneca dose in four weeks? And they respond to that and say, I'm not a medical doctor, rather a geneticist. However, based on the available data on severe side effects, it seems to me that most of the cases occurred after the first one, not the second one. But it is important to understand that he's a geneticist. So he understands from a genetic point of view, if wrong splicing occurs, there could be damaged protein. We all know that and they know that as well. And they kind of connected it to a hypothesis. But generally, they're saying, I'm not a doctor, so I can't tell you more about that. Now, with this one, there is another part which is really important. And so this is their PDF. And as you can tell, I went over the PDF as well. Um, so let's go here. There are a couple of things that are important to look at. Here, check this out. They're saying AstraZeneca sequence was deduced from publication. So somebody said, where did you get the material, the information about spike protein? Because these companies don't tell exactly how it is made. So they said, we took that from wherever we could, plus some folks sent it. So that's fine. Uh, then there is another question, which they are answering. This is their paper that, hey, why, if this is happening, why in the nervous system, for example, why not somewhere else? And the answer is interesting. Um, I would let you assess that answer. But their answer is, just one second, I'm trying to find where it is. Here, several questions are remaining. Why does this happen preferentially in the sinus of the central nervous system? Why here? The involvement of central nervous system sinuses, besides other sites in the body, could be explained by the non-unidirectional blood flow. So they're saying that the brain sinuses don't have valves in them. So it is not that they push the blood to one side. The blood can keep going back and forth. Depending on body posture, and when sleeping. So they're saying, you know what? A person who has blood in their sinuses, if they have a specific posture, for example, I do this, then I do this. Blood would move back, blood would move forward. Or when I'm sleeping, the blood would stagnate. That is a time when the spike protein binding to the endothelium would start occurring and damage would start occurring. This is their reasoning for why this would happen in the brain. So they have similar, re again, this is a very weak reasoning, but this is a reasoning. Maybe that is how it would be uh, explained. So they say, thus the residence time, residence time of soluble spike protein in the area of our body and the possibility to bind with the endothelial cells that express are, is a reason. They continue to go on and talk more about similar things here. As a matter of fact, elderly people. So then they have to answer this question that why young women and not elderly? Their response is very simple. As a matter of fact, elderly people may use more frequently or even on daily basis drugs that decrease coagulation and inflammation. This could be the reason why elderly don't have it. So then if we go back and we say, OK, what about men who are younger than 50 who are not elderly? Then they don't have an answer. Then they would say, hey, we're working on the data. Then another important thing is, why is it not happening everywhere then? Because if we say that adenovirus-based system is going to cause this, then it should happen everywhere. Or if not 100% everywhere, then maybe 10%, 20%, 30%. But this is observed, as you know, in a very tiny numbers. And again, I want to make sure that I am clear on this one. I made a lot of noise about it. So when I say it is observed in tiny numbers, doesn't mean I'm dismissing it. What I'm saying is that the mechanism has to either be generalizable, if we have to be scared of it, or mechanism is actually there is some mechanism that causes thrombosis. And this may be that, but then it is at a very lower uh, 
chance because the mechanism is really difficult to produce. And I'll, I'll explain why. So he, they're, they're saying another speculation could potentially explain why this happens so rarely in first vaccinated people. Neutralizing antibodies prevent binding of soluble spike protein. So here what they're saying is possibly in some people. So imagine in your mind those people who developed clotting. They're saying in these people, possibly neutralizing antibodies were not generated. The spike protein got out of the cell. The neutralizing antibody was not there. So nobody checked the spike protein. Nobody said, hey, spike protein, where are you going? I'm an antibody. I'm, bind I'm going to bind with you. And they, the spike protein just started roaming around freely because there was nobody to stop it. In that process, it went into blood as well. Then it went to co connect with AS2. That's what they're saying here. So they're saying another speculation could potentially explain why this happens so rarely in first vaccinated people. Neutralizing antibodies prevent binding of soluble spike protein to endothelial cells that express AS2. Moreover, only AS2 bound soluble spike protein will cause the above mentioned ADCC react ADC reaction. So FLCCC. <laughs> Therefore, it could well be that due to specific MAC combination, some vaccination people, vaccinated people are unable to produce neutralizing antibodies against spike. So they're saying there are some people who cannot produce this uh, uh, neutralizing antibodies, which would then do this. And then they continue to go over and discuss these things. And they have a diagram. Now I want to put some of my commentary here to understand that are we really looking at a generalizable vaccine-induced production of spike protein. So let's look at them one by one. I'm going to go back to this diagram here. In this diagram, what we are saying is the following. And now imagine this is our theory that we have accepted it. What we are saying is from a cell, spike proteins came out. These spike proteins are not challenged by anything. No local phagocytes, no local dendrit dendrit dendritic cells, no local macrophages, no neutrophils, no natural killer cells, no antibodies. Nobody stopped it. This spike protein came out happily roaming around and ended up in the blood vessel. How did it end up in the blood vessel and nobody stopped it so far because there are no antibodies. There are no other cells getting in front of them. So they went maybe the lymphatic route. They went to the lymph node from the lymph node. They entered the bloodstream. Fine. But now when they are in the bloodstream, the authors say it connects with the ACE2. And then the antibody binds with it, which starts the process of ADCCC. Also ADCC. But guys, didn't we just say that there is no antibody? Because of that, the spike protein could actually come out. So if there is no antibody, then why is there antibody here? For the mechanism. I know that if we go to authors, they would say, well, we do not know exactly what happens here. But we think this happens, and we are working on producing it. So the problem is going to be, if there is an antibody here, then there's going to be an antibody here as well. And if that is the case, then that antibody is going to stop it. Or let's say there is no antibody, then there is no antibody here either. And then this mechanism will not happen. Then there has to be a macrophage or a dendritic cell in those kind of cells that would do this clearing of these guys who are escaping. And somehow those are not there, which is also abnormal. It is not normal. One way they try to explain this is the following. They said, in the beginning when spike proteins are produced, at that time, adaptive arm is not working. This is in their comments. Adaptive arm is not working. And because of that, there are no antibodies. And that allows the spike proteins to run around freely. And now the system is going to take some days to produce antibodies. So meanwhile, those spike proteins are out. I have a problem with that as well. So we are saying that for four, five days, six, seven days, 10, 15 days, these spike proteins are just connected with ACE2, waiting for some antibodies to come around after it is being produced. Then attach to the ADCC 
and uh, sorry, NK cells, natural cells, and start antibody dependent cytotoxic response. See, it says antibody dependent cytotoxic response or cellular cytotoxicity. It needs antibody. Okay. So if that is the case, then here, how is this C1Q going to connect? Because it is going to be attracted to FC receptors, which are antibody receptors. So we are once again banking on the presence of the antibody, but we are banking on the absence of the antibody here for the spike protein to get out and go out. We are also banking on the cell to make an incorrect protein and still go, get away with making it. We are also banking that a ribosome would work with an RNA that is damaged and still create a beautifully sophisticated protein without one part that is useful. Again, does that mean they're wrong? I don't know. Does that mean I'm right? I do not know. This is a hypothesis they have put forward. So they know, hopefully, all these mechanisms as well. So I'm just going to quickly go over some of the comments that I had written. So first, incorrect gene splicing has to occur. So how many things have to happen for this to work? Number one, in adenovirus-based vaccines, incorrect gene splicing has to occur. But before that, let me back up. You could actually say, OK, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Bean, <laughs> some people called me Mr. Bean a few days. If this is not the mechanism, then what is the mechanism? And so there is a German research. They have a mechanism that antibodies actually produced can cause the clotting. So you don't have to actually bring in the spike protein to do it. You can just bring in the antibodies to cause damage. Maybe this is the mechanism. Maybe the mechanism that I have been proposing many times, and that is when a cell that has antibody uh, spike proteins, when a cell is broken down, it can release those spike proteins. Maybe these are the ones that went to the lymphatic system and then came in here and maybe caused issue. But can that issue be so big that it would actually cause clotting and uh, death, I think it is not going to be the case. It will have to be antibodies, not the spike proteins. But they have one more thought there. They say the adenovirus can stay in our body for days, days, weeks, months. And because of that, it can continue to produce these. So maybe it is these and not antibodies. I think that antibodies from B cells can also be produced for days, months, weeks, years, and that can also do it. So going back to the comments, incorrect gene splicing has to occur for this hypothesis to work. So cell has to work with the incorrect gene splicing, allow the incorrect gene splicing, and then work with the incorrect messenger RNA and work with the damaged protein and take that all as a correct good thing. Spike protein has to be built but not have an anchor point. Spike protein has to be soluble or part of it has to become soluble and go through this. Then it has to be secreted, but still not attached to, look, we are saying this spike protein is going to get out of here and go and attach here. Why is it not attaching to the cells here? Local epithelial cells have ACE2. GIT cells have ACE2, lung cells have ACE2, kidney cells have ACE2, heart cells have ACE2, blood vessels have ACE2, throat areas have ACE2. ACE2 are present in many places. So somehow ACE2 here on the other cells, spike proteins are not going to, but they're going to endothelium and going to do it. Or if I counter my point, because you're talking hypothesis, there are so many spike proteins that over local ACE2 are all overwhelmed and then even more quantity available to circulate in the body and attach with the blood vessels Th that would be very difficult but that may be the possibility then vaccine has to fail in producing neutralizing antibodies as well because if the vaccine had produced neutralizing antibodies then this whole game is not going to happen this thing is going to get stuck here so now we have to find a person whose cell allowed to make a bad, whose cells made a bad RNA, then allowed the protein to happen, then allowed the spike protein to be secreted out, spike protein was good enough, then allowed the local immune system not to pick it up, 
then allowed the local ACE2 receptors not to pick it up, then allowed this to get into the blood vessels and then go and attach there while also not making the neutralizing antibodies. While also not having the phagocytes and the, the natural killer cells and dendritic cells and other cells attack it in the tissue, but attack it in the endothelium and somehow magically anti antibodies would appear there. Now this combination here, which is attacked, this needs antibody. So I talked about that. And finally, complement has to become activated. And complement activation also requires antigen and antibodies. And once again, that would mean antibodies are present. So this is an exhaustive look. I know that it is one hour now. The reason I spent time on this, my apologies, many people actually have become very annoyed with me to say, be, be, <laughs> be quiet, be brief. But the thing is, you can't go over these things trying to be brief. Uh, I know about, so if somebody is going to bring up the ovaries and presence of this, I'm going to talk about that as well. The question, authors concede that this may be a hypothesis, so they're not yet fully done. And even if it is a hypothesis, it may be at a very rare level. So it still is not yet fully baked. This is very important. So Nick, I missed you so much in so many days. Blood flow in venous sinuses is most likely turbulent static rather than unidirectional laminar flow based on their size, shape, increasing probability of thrombosis there. That is, that is what they're saying. But the problem is, a spike protein has to escape from my deltoid muscle and nobody said it anything over here. Then it enters the blood system. It goes in the lymph first and lymphatic. Nobody said anything. Lymph is very slow. Local interstitial tissue flow is very slow. Nobody said them anything. Nobody touched them. And it ended up in the blood vessel. From there, it ended up in the brain. And then it got st static there in the brain and caused it. So let's say if that is the case, then what happened in the GIT? GIT's blood flow is not slow. Then why are we getting GIT ischemia and people with the, with the GIT disturbances and ischemia and diarrhea and nausea? Or what about the skin and the bleeding there? Or what about the legs? We can say for all of them, well, blood stayed there for more time because that is the reason for, for clotting, blood staying or stasis of the blood for some time. So for we can answer this kind of a question with this kind of question for every place. But that really is not a generalizable statement. And maybe this is it. This is the hypothesis. And this is a correct mechanism as well. And this only happens in a very rare case where a person cell allow incorrect RNA to be formed, or allow that RNA to be developed into a good spike protein but damaged that spike protein to be released, not touched by antibodies. This is the biggest gap that in the local area, not touched by antibodies. But when it reaches the blood vessels, then touched by antibodies in the local area, not picked up by phagocytes. In the other areas, natural killer cells run and start working on it. And then activating the complement in the blood vessel, but not in the interstitial area. These are the gaps. They, they would work on that. So here we are, um, in my opinion, I would request you to, Denise says, ischemic colitis sucks. So correct. It's very painful. There is nausea, diarrhea. There are so many problems. But GIT's blood flow is not as slow and unidirectional as brain, for example. So then why would this happen in the GIT? Look, clinically, this is happening. So we know there is some mechanism. Is that this maybe? They themselves are not sure. They're saying, hey, this is pre-preprint, or as they called it, version one of the preprint. And they said, we just wanted to put it out so we are all aware. So I think I have beaten it to <laughs> the horse has been beaten many times now. Sue says, can you talk about how antibodies get into blood? Yes, very, very simple. Antibodies are made in the lymph nodes and in other tissues, the B cells that are sitting in the lymphatic system and releasing antibodies in the blood. 
So not only in the blood, in the interstitium as well. This I would love. So Mega Kitty says, people know aspirin or ibuprofen makes matters worse. Um, what I would love is this. There is a hypothesis. People are working on it. Thanks to these researchers as well that they're working on it. Thanks to other researchers too. We should just have a way to handle clotting. And that way is easier than scaring everyone with the antibodies, uh, spike proteins running around in the body. So I'm going to stop here. Let's do some um, chit chat. Let's do some more talk there. And then we'll go further. Doug says, question, why would the adenovirus spike DNA have introns? How about I answer in the chit chat? Answer is very simple, though. What they do is they took the whole spike protein's RNA and converted it into a DNA honestly, sincerely. They did not pre-process to remove introns. They banked on our system to say, we can recognize where introns are and remove it. So they touched it the least, which is the right thing to do. What if they pre-processed the spike protein RNA or DNA, then sent it to us and the vaccine didn't work because that pre-processing had some error? Here, this is also an error. They're saying that the way the DNA is built, it has propensity for errors. So this is like a software engineer writing code that has, has defects. And so the, they would say, yeah, sure, I'm sorry, I wrote bad code, I would fix it. It's a similar thing that the code that is written for this uh, spike protein, it may have defects in that code, how it is put together. And so they may have to go and fix it. For example, they say they say that DNA-based vaccine people, adenovirus-based, should reduce the introns or, or uh, codons that can be attacked this way. So they have a suggestion to say, improve your, your recipe. So maybe it is a problem with the recipe. And that is just like writing incorrect software. And the original engineers would go back and they say, OK, you know what? These guys said, here is what can happen. I'm going to fix it, maybe. So <clears throat> Denise says, I'll race you. Denise, who are you racing? Uh, Eric Doc says, thank you, brilliant bean. All cool beans here tomorrow. Maybe stay strong. Yes. So I'm going to hang up. Please do me a favor. Like, subscribe, and share. And there are links in the description if you wanted to support this. If you don't want to use PayPal, there is a buy me a coffee. There is a PayPal as well, and there is a patron as well. And thank you very much uh, to Margaret. Once again, she just sent in yesterday a very generous donation. So Margaret, thank you very much. And I would see you in a few minutes. Doug, let's answer your question in, a, in the chit chat. 